Mother, how long have we been traveling? Approximately 24 days. Ash, any suggestions from you or Mother? No, we're still collecting. I've got access to Mother now, and I'll get my own answers. Thank you. You are listening to Yutani, the podcast for all things alien, AI, robotics, sci-fi, and technology. Hello there, this is Clara, but you can call me Mother. And welcome to another live stream of Dan O'Bannon and Ronald Chusett's Alien Scripts. Now, I know I've, I've been a bit busy lately and I was meaning to pick this up straight after Alien Day, but I kind of got aliened out <laughs> with um, everything that has been happening. And I also had to prepare for uh, Comic-Con in Melbourne. So unfortunately, yeah. Uh, I took a bit of a break, but now I'm back and I'm determined to finish this script this week because I've got some big news. Uh, I've been sent some Ridley Grams, which is really awesome, and I want to share them. And it turns out no one else has seen them yet. Uh, I've, I've checked with a whole bunch of um, other people and yeah, they're, they are legit and I wanted to do an analysis of them. so. As soon as this script is done, I'll be going straight on to Covenant. And I really wanted to do it on the anniversary of the film. But unfortunately, you know, I, I missed the boat. But um, it's really great to have this Yutani exclusive. So uh, stay tuned. Anyway, uh, I'm doing the script analysis on my own tonight. Um, mainly because I couldn't find another co-host who was available. Everyone's been really busy. Which I totally get. Everyone's um, been doing their own thing, uh, so um, make sure you head over to Prometheus by Minute because then you can go and listen to the wonderful work Connor has been doing, and um, yeah, check it out. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna try something new. I've got my phone here, and I wanted to put in stream markers as I go page by page. Um, this is the first time I've used my setup on um, Twitch with all of the new OBS settings and I've got a new voice meter, uh, like mixing down everything that I'm talking about. So you just have to bear with me um, as we kind of go through this all. And I haven't got my headphones, so I've got no way of testing whether this is working. So I'm Hopefully it's working. <laughs> so yeah, come and have a listen. So we're going to go to page 71. For those people out there. Uh, let me just prepare. The next one. All right. So I've got my little friend here. <laughs> Face hugger. Um, so page 71. For those people playing at home um, this is the original script and we've got characters that aren't Ripley and Dallas and stuff like that it's kind of all mixed up and around so I'll briefly go through the characters names in the front okay we've got Chaz Standard who is the captain a leader politician believes that any action is better than no action and that's obviously Dallas We've also got Martin Roby. Now that's actually Ripley, uh, who is the executive officer. Cautious but intelligent, a survivor. Well, that's pretty obvious. <laughs> Who's going to live to the end? Uh, Del Brassard is the navigator. Uh, that ended up being um, Lambert and says that they are an adventurer and brash glory hound. Now, Obviously, that's not the persona that uh, Lambert played, but you'll you'll find that some of these characters are a bit mixed up because this is the original scripts before some of the changes were made. Then we've got Sandy Malconis, who's 
the communications tech who is an intellectual and a romantic and that's supposed to be well um that's supposed to be kane uh, Cleve Hunter is a mining engineer who is high strung and came along to make his fortune. Now, I'm guessing that's Parker because he's always asking about the bonus situation. And then we've got Jay Fast who's an engine tech who's a worker and unimaginative and that's probably why he keeps on going right. Um, and then there is a little note down the bottom here. It says the crew is unisex and all parts are interchangeable for men or women. So if you didn't know that, it was actually Dan O'Bannon that had that idea originally. I was mistaken. I, I thought originally it was Ridley who chose who um, was to be the men and the women. And I guess like Dan wrote them as men in the script originally, but Ridley then chose who were gonna who was gonna be women. So when when Dan wrote the scripts uh, and Ron wrote the scripts with him, they they just had real people in mind men or women who could have played these parts so it's really a credit to uh group effort as to who was cast as who and um i think it was ridley who determined that it would be a flip on people's expectations that ripley would survive so ripley was going to be female anywho let's go back to page 71 so now as you know, uh, Roby, who is Ripley, pounds his panel. We made it. Damn, we made it. Standard says. You bet we made it, Martin. Set course for Earth. Accelerate us into star, star Drive. Star Drive? That's really interesting because we know it as uh, FTL or light speed. So, hmm, that's really cool. Uh, Roby says, with great pleasure. Roby begins to punch buttons. Malkonis says, I feel like, <laughs> I feel like an escape from, I feel like an escapee from hell. Uh, this scene dissolves to the exterior ship at light speed later. The ship's speed is so great that there is perceptible movement in the universe all around. There is a strange corona effect which causes the stars approaching the ship to appear blue and the receding ones to be red. This is redshift, made visible because of their incredible velocity. So I just want to pause it there. It's really interesting because I've been speaking to uh, Bradley from Aliens Gateway Station, who I'm also a co-admin of that group. Uh, which is all about Alien and the EU, and if you're interested in comics and stuff like that, the books, uh, as well as the movies, uh, come along and join in. Um, he is a bit of a science nerd like me, but he, he knows a bit more. I'm not really good at math, uh, but we, I asked him to figure out the speed of the Nostromo and the Prometheus and the Slarko, and when we put it onto a graph with a uh, exponential rate of growth for um, the technology improving and also for a, a direct line even though the directors of those films did not intend it with the script and the way it's written it actually fits quite well so I'll be publishing um, that research and those findings on um, the blog later on if you want to have a look at that sort of thing because like I'm a bit of a nerd he's a bit of a nerd if you're a nerd then you will really appreciate that sort of detail anyway <sighs> interior bridge outer space they are unstrapping I'm, I'm assuming it's belts <laughs> Roby says that's the part that always makes me feel like I'm gonna puke when I when we accelerate into light speed Ah, there's the word light speed. Standard says, quit complaining, we're in space. They rise and head out of the room. Interior, corridor. As they walk along, turning to page 72 now, I'm going to put in a marker. Page 72. Standard says, I think the best thing to do with Brassard is to just freeze him as he is. 
It'll arrest the progress of his disease, and he can get complete medical attention when we get back to the colonies. Uh, just to let you know, Brassard was the one who got face hugged, even though um, Brassard is supposed to be uh, Lambert. So I guess um, they kind of changed uh, Kane into a, an amalgamation of Brassard and Malconis, and Lambert was on her own being. Um, quite frightened uh, and not much of a, a brash glory hand as, as Brassard is being described as here. Anyway, back to it. Roby says, we'll have to go into quarantine, maybe for quite a while. Standard says, that's okay. He can remain in hypersleep until they're ready to treat him. Okay. Stopping right there. So there's cryosleep and hypersleep. I think hypersleep is what they call cryogenic sleep in Alien. So it's interesting that Dan O'Bannon and Ronald Chusek came up with that originally in the script. And that's something that aesthetically uh, the universe has stuck to in terms of uh, canon or, or the way that they use the words. All right, next part. They enter the infirmary. Interior, infirmary. As they enter the room, they are shocked to see Brassard sitting up in bed, awake. Ah, oh, okay. Brassard, hoarsely. Mouth's so dry. Can I have some water? Instantly, Roby brings him a plastic cup of water. Brassard gulps it down in a swallow. Brassard continues, more. Roby quickly fills a much bigger, bigger container and hands it to Brassard, who greedily consumes the entire thing. Then he sags, panting, on the bunk. Softly. Standard says, How do you feel, Del? Brassard weakly responds, Wretched. What happened to me? Standard says, Don't you remember? Brassard then says, don't remember nothing. Can't hardly remember my name. Roby says, or asks, are you in pain? By the way, this is page 73. You should probably put in a marker. Page 73. Roby asks, are you in pain? Brassard replies, not exactly. I just feel like somebody has been beating me with a rubber hoses for about six years. Malconis laughs at this remark. Brassard smiles faintly at him. Standard says, hell, you're in great shape. You've got your sense of humor back. Brassard says, God, I'm hungry. Roby replies, Dal, what's the last thing that you can remember? Brassard then says, I don't know. Roby asks, do you remember the pyramid? Brassard says, no, just some horrible dreams about smothering. Where are we? Standard says, we're going home. We're in hyperspace. So hyperspace, hypersleep. Hmm, I see a pattern here. Malcona says, we're going into the freezers now. Brassard replies, I'm really starving. Can we get some food before we go in the freezers? Standard laughs. I think that's a pretty reasonable request. Ooh, we're getting up to the part. I wonder if we're going to get to it in this episode. Page 74. Interior. Multi-purpose room. The entire crew is seated around the table eating 
huge portions greedily. The cat eats from the dish up on the table. Hunter says, Boy, do I feel a lot better. It's a straight shot back to the colonies, and then we can start taking bids on the pay dirt. Any bets on the, the top bid? Fast says, chewing. Well, we should at least be able to each buy our own planet. They all chuckle. Malconis says, I'm going to write a book about this expedition. I'm going to call it the Snark Log. <laughs> so by the way, um, the Nostromo is called the Snark uh, in this script. Standard, replies stiffly. The commander normally has first publication rights. Malconis replies, maybe we could write it together. Roby says, first thing I'm going to do when I get back is to eat some biological food. Malconis replies, what's the matter? Don't you like this stuff? Roby says, tastes like something you'd feed chicken to make it lay more eggs. Standard says, oh, it's okay. I've had better cag than this, but I've had worse too, if you know what I mean. Faust replies, I kind of like it. Roby says, you like this shit? Faust replies, it grows on you. By the way, we're on page 75. <laughs> uh, let's see. Roby says, you know what they make this stuff out of? Faust replies in a very annoyed tone. Yes, I know what they make it out of. So what? It's food now. You're eating it. Roby says, I didn't say it was bad for you. It's just kind of sickening, that's all. Hunt says, do we have to talk about this kind of crap at the dinner table? Ooh, here comes the best part. Hold on. Am I going to act this part out? I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> Suddenly, unexpectedly, Brassard grimaces and groans. Standard says, what's wrong? Brassard, his voice training. Uh, I don't... I don't, I don't know. I'm getting these crabs. The others stare at him in alarm. Another groan is torn from his lips. He clutches the edge of the table with his hands. His knuckles are whitening. Standard says, breathe deeply. Rassad screaming, oh, oh God, it hurts so bad. Roby says, what, Del, what? Brassard's face is screwed up in a mask of agony. He's trembling violently from head to foot. Ooh. Dana Bannon is a master of words. <laughs> Brassard, in an incoherent sh sh shriek. Oh my god! A red smear of blood blossoms on the chest of Brassard's tunic. Their eyes are all riveted to Brassard's chest as the fabric of his tunic is ripped open and a horrible, nasty little head the size of a man's fist pushes out. Everybody screams and leaps back from the table. The cat spits and bolts. The disgusting little head lunges, comes spitting spurting out of Brassard's chest, trailing a thick worm-like tail, splattering fluids and blood, and lands in the middle of the dishes and the food on the table, and scurries away while the men are stamping, stampeding for safe ground. When they finally regain control of themselves, it has escaped. Brassard lies slumped in his chair, a huge hole in his chest, spouting blood. The dishes are scattered. 
the food is covered with blood and slime. Hunter says, Oh no, oh no. Faust replies, What was that? What the Christ was that? Malcona says, It was growing in him the whole time. And he didn't even know it. Slowly, they gather around Brassard's gutted corpse. Roby says, that thing used him for an incubator. Exterior, ship, outer space. A hatch slides open on the side of the ship and Brassard's wrapped body tumbles silently out. An electronic bass drum beats a dirge as Brassard drifts into eternity. Oof. That was a bit of a mouthful. I couldn't read that very well. Now we're on to page 77. Interior. Corridor. The entire remaining crew is walking toward the bridge. Malcona says, We can't go into hypersleep with that thing running loose. Running around loose. Hunter then says, We'd be sitting ducks in the freezers. Roby replies, but we can't kill it. If we kill it, it will spill all its body acids right through the hull and out into space. Faust replies, shit. Standard says, we'll have to catch it and eject it from the ship. Malconus, sighing. <sighs> well, I kind of hate to point, out, point it out. But all of our supplies are based on us spending strictly limited amount of time out of suspended animation. And as you know, we used up most of the time in harvesting. Hmm. I want to just pause it there for a sec. So it's really interesting because a lot of people are always asking, you know, why do people bother going into hypersleep and stuff like that, especially with the Salako only taking three weeks to get to lb426 um so in here malconis says that you know every single bit of like air food stuff like that is accounted for when traveling so it makes a lot of sense that they would go into hypersleep when they're doing something like that so yeah it's interesting it just makes aliens make a lot more sense <laughs> all right back to it standard says We've got about a week left, right? Hunter replies. And then we run out of food and oxygen. Faust then adds, the water will still recycle. Ruby replies, we won't need it then. Stannis says, all right. So that's what we've got, a week. It's plenty of time. Page 78. Roby says, but if we haven't caught it in a week, then we have to go into the freezers anyway. They enter the bridge. Interior. Bridge. Standard says, so does anybody have any suggestions? Faust replies, we could put on our pressure suits and blow all the air out of the ship. That would kill it. Standard says, no, we can't afford to lose that much, much oxygen. We're going to have to flush it out. Malconus replies, how? Standard says, room by room, corridor by corridor. No one likes this thought. Malconus asks, and what do we do when we find it? Standard says, we'll have to trap it somehow. If we had a really strong piece of net, we could bag it. Faust says, we could cut a section out of that metalite netting. It won't hold up to that acid, but aside from that, it's pretty strong. Roby says, we have to avoid injuring it. We really, what we really need is some electric animal prods. Hunter then replies, I think I could cobble something together. 
a long metal rod with a battery in it. Give it a hell of a shock. Standard says, good, get on it. But first, I'm issuing a standing order. From this moment forth, every one of us will wear protective garments, including helmets. Let's get down to the locker and change. By the way, we're on page 79 now. They start for the exit. Exterior. Outer space. The snark continues on its way to the weird vortex of hyperspace. Interior. Corridors. In ship. Standard is walking purposefully along the corridor alone. He is garmented up in an unusual outfit which makes him look like a riot policeman, including a clear plastic helmet. He reaches a corner and turns, but this new passageway has a different gravity orientation. Standard seems to be walking down a vertical wall. He makes yet another disorienting turn and now he is walking upside down. He reaches a set of steps and climbs them, or rather, down them. I just want to stop there. So I think uh, Dan O'Bannon was deeply inspired by 2001 A Space Odyssey just as much as Ridley Scott was and this part here is reminiscent of that part where uh, in 2001 where you've got the um, spaceship stewardess uh, bringing a tray of food and she's walking in this corridor and walking up and around and going this way and going that way and it's like a really show-offy way to show that they're in space and that was kind of really amazing for its time I guess compared to like special effects now that sort of stuff would be green screened or maybe they just do something else but I'm guessing that they didn't add this in because it would have required them to build a set that was it was just not in the budget because I blew so much on <laughs> the, the ship and the space jockey and the outfits and stuff like that so um we still haven't seen anything like that in the alien universe as of yet. Um, and I wonder whether the, that sort of thing will ever appear in the prequels. I, I honestly can't remember a time that this has happened in the alien universe. So if you guys know of a time that this has been shown, I mean like other than a comic because we've seen these in comics before. Um, like in a movie because I honestly can't remember whether this was in a movie or not um yeah let me know anyway back to it interior ventral observation dome view of outer space Malconis is seated in the dome upside down peering down into space he also wears the protective suit standard upside down climbs into the dome it is dark and eerie here under the stars of interstellar space, a few glowing panels provide the only illumination. Standard says, I thought I'd find you here. Malkonis replies, I was thinking of a line from an old poem. Water, water everywhere, but not a drop to drink. All that space out there, and we're trapped in this ship. Standard says, that's the one about the albatross, right? Now we're up to page 80. Morcona says, We can't even radio for help. The carrier wave wouldn't reach its destination till long after we've died and turned to dust. We are utterly, absolutely alone. Can anybody really visualize such a scale of distance halfway across creation? Just want to stop there. Uh, in Alien Covenants, um, The Last Supper, uh, where you've got the Covenant crew together, uh, I think Aram says something about 
creation and majesty. I know that David says uh, he believes in creation before the chest burster comes out, but I, I, I feel like it's kind of like a homage to this part of the script, and it's not supposed to be a sort of like religious um, saying. It's just trying to explain the expanse of space and trying to explain that is, is trying to describe something that is unexplainable, like I think like God to like the sensibilities of um, Dan O'Bannon and Shuset in the terms of sci-fi for them, they're trying to convey this epicness which is like beyond something that we can comprehend anyway uh, Stanit says we came out there we'll go back a long time by the clock but a short time to us Morconis says time and space have no meaning out here we're living in Einstein uh, an Einsteinian equation funny they should say that because we <laughs> came up with the equations for light speed um, or should I say Brad came up with the equations for light speed because he's like super smart and I'm just interested in that sort of detail. Um, Standard says, I can see you're putting your spare time to good use. Leans forward, uh, Standard leans forward and taps him on the knee. Let me tell you something. You keep staring at hyperspace for long enough. They'll be peeling you off a wall. I've seen it happen. Malcona smiles at him. We're the new pioneers, Chaz. We even have our own special diseases. <sighs> it's such a thing to say. I think it's really interesting because that's something that uh, Alex White, author of The Cold Forge, had come up with for Blue Marsalis because she and her parents were pioneers in space and they had their own sort of diseases, which was... Um, I can't even remember it right now, um, but I'll, I'll link to it in the blog. Okay, uh, come on, let's go. Uh, Standard says, come on, let's go above and see how they're coming on with the gear. Interior, bridge. The whole crew has assembled. Faust is unfolding several yards of shimmering metallic netting. Hunter hands out five thin rods like metal broom handles. Hunter then says, these have portable generators in them. They're insulated down to here. Just be careful not to touch the end. He demonstrates by touching the tip of one of the rods to a metal object. A blue spark leaps. Um, I think this went like, Parker, I think? This <laughs> touches the rod to the roof of the Nostromo, which I think is like really dangerous, but you know, what would I know? I thought it would short out the circuits, but apparently not. Maybe they're insulated. All right, now we're up to page 81. I'm starting to get tired, so I'm glad I'm only going up to page 90. I'm getting old. <laughs> Reading this is making me go to sleep because I'm like, I'm getting rocks to sleep by alien. Anyway, uh, Faust says, might even incinerate the damn thing. Standard sharply replies, I hope not. Hunter says, don't worry, it won't damage it. It'll just give it a little incentive. Standard says, how do we locate the creature? Faust goes, with these. He picks up a small portable unit. Faust continues, tracking device. You set it to search for a moving object. It hasn't got much range, but when you get within a certain distance, it starts beeping. Standard takes the device and studies it. These will be very useful. At least we won't have to go digging around in closets with our bare hands. All right, here's the battle plan. We're going to break into teams, start systematically covering the ship. Whoever finds it first catches it in the net and ejects it from the nearest airlock. Clear? Roby replies, even simple. Standard shoots him a vicious look then continues. Standard says, for starters, let's make sure the bridge is safe. Faust takes the device and turns it on. He scans around the room. 
Now I'll go to page 82. Faust replies, it's clever. Standard says, all right, Roby and Malconus. We'll go with Faust. Hunter and I will make up the second team. They start doling out the equipment. Standard continues, we'll carry communicators. We want to keep in constant touch. Interior, corridors and ship. Malconus and Roby carry out the net while Faust walks directly behind it carrying the tracking device. He continually scans it from side to side. Faust says, nothing yet, nothing. We can move pretty fast as long as there's nothing on the tracker. Interior, other corridors. Standard and Hunter move silently along. Standard is forced to serve a double function, carrying one edge of the net and the tracker as well. Interior, corridors. Roby's team is moving at a fairly brisk pace when Faust says, hold it. Faust's tracker is beeping and a small light flashes. Faust continues, I've got something. Immediately, they grow very tense and start looking around. Roby says, where is it coming from? I'm going to go to page 83. Faust peers closely at the tracker and frowns. Machine screwed up. I can't tell. Needle spinning all over the dial. Malconis says, is it malfunctioning? Faust turns the tracker on its side. The needle stabilizes. Faust says, no, just confused. It's coming from below us. They all look down at their feet. Interior maintenance level. Roby, Melconis, and Faust come carefully down a set of crude metal stairs into a drab functional section of the ship. The corridors in this level are lit by rows of bare bulbs in the ceiling. The effect is ugly and confining. <laughs> what a description. They stop at the foot of the stairs and move into position spreading the net across the corridor so we all know this part this is the part where they find jones uh, but you know we'll see how it goes in the script roby goes okay faust looking at the tracker and nodding down the passageway that way they begin to walk down the passageway footsteps clanging on the raw metal flooring it is extremely dark what happened to the lights? Bulbs burnt out. Nobody bothered to replace them. They switch on the helmet lights. Hmm, that's interesting. They've got helmets on. They didn't say that before. Where did the helmets come from? <laughs> Sorry, I'm just being an ass. All right, page 84. We are nearly in the home run. Camera follows them around for a couple of turnings and then Faust continues. Hold it. They all stop quickly, almost stumbling. Faust continues, whispering. It's within four meters. Roby and Malconis heft the net, each keeping his prod in hand. Faust, prod in one hand and tracker in the other, has the unpleasant job of approaching the source of the signal. He moves with great care in a half crouch ready to leap back at any second. Prod extended, constantly glancing at the tracker. The tracking device leads him right up to the small hatch or door in one wall. Behind his plastic mask, sweat is pouring down Faust's face. As he sits down the tracker and reaches for the little door, he raises the prod, grabs grasps the doll handle and yanks it open and jams the electric prod inside. With a nerve-shattering squall, a small creature comes flying out of the cabinet, eyes glaring, claws flashing. Instinctively, they throw the net over it. But Roby says, very annoyed, 
Oh, hold it. They open the net and release the creature. It's the cat, hissing and spitting, and scampers away. Malcona says, we're making fools of ourselves. Roby's communicator beeps. Roby says into the communicator, yes. Standard replies, overfills it. We've got it up here. It's trapped. Get here fast. Roby says, where are you? Standard overfiltered. Food storage room. <laughs> Roby says, we, we are coming. The dash for the, uh, they dash for the stairs. Sorry. Totally losing it here. I'm on page 85. Putting these stream markers in is like time consuming. Okay. Interior corridors and chip. Roby, Faust, and Malconis charge down the hallways until they arrive at interior corridor outside food storage room. Standard and Hunter are waiting for them in hysterics. Hunter says, we saw it inside and slammed the door on it. It's in there now. On the other side of the door, crashing and banging can be heard. Roby says, what's it doing? Having a seizure? Standard says, it started crashing around after we locked it in. Standard says, it start. oh, sorry. <laughs> Roby says, now what? Standard says, I guess we open the door and net it. Hunter then replies, I hate to open that door. Okay, page 86. Sorry, stream marker, page 86. Again, the thing can be heard crashing around inside. Standard says, it looks completely different from the first one. It's more like a worm with legs and tentacles. Hmm, that's interesting. I guess they didn't have the final design for the alien yet. So if you have a look at Ron Cobb's first attempt of the alien, it's quite hilarious. It kind of looks more like a crab. Um, but anyway, uh, Faust says, well, we better do something. Hunter then says, maybe we don't have to. It's trapped in there. We could just leave it in there all the way back to Earth. Standard snaps. Don't be an idiot. Faust says, I know what we can do. We can pump poison gas into the room and kill it. Through those ventilator slots there. He indicates a row of slots in the bottom of the door. Roby says, hey, wait a minute. That's all our food supplies in there. We can't pump poison gas all over them. Standard replies, once we kill the thing, we won't need the food anymore. We can go straight into hypersleep. Also, it sounds like the thing is already doing a pretty good job on our supplies. It may be fouling them all. So I just want to stop there. It's interesting because the alien seems, well, they don't really see it, but it, the alien seems like it's eating food because it's in the food locker. So, um, hmm. That's, uh, that's interesting. It goes into competition with what we've... Oh, not really. Um, the Neomorphs look like they eat human flesh. Uh, we've seen aliens brain humans before. So I guess that they do kind of eat, but we've never really seen them eat eat. Um, all right. Roby says, you win. Faust says, somebody give me a hand. I'll get the stuff. Interior, corridor, outside food locker. Later. Camera pulls back to reveal that they are fastening a large... <coughs> By the way, we're on page 87. Oh, we're nearly done. I'm so tired. <laughs> Fun uh, Funnel-shaped device over the ventilator grill at the bottom of the door. This funnel is attached to a thick hose which runs back to a large metal tank with pressure gorges. Standard says, get those masks on. They pull on gas, gas masks. This stuff's deadly. I hope, I hope we know what we're doing. Standard says, go ahead, Jay. Faust turns on the machine. It begins to throb as it pumps the gas through the hose and into the room. Immediately, the crashing noises rise in crescendo 
and the thing can be heard screeching and sque squealing. I just want to stop there. So it's interesting about the whole poisonous gas thing because they ended up using that in the Narcissus escape shuttle in the end of Alien when the alien is like hiding and you're like why would you pump gas into those crevices and maybe it's because they they've had alien life forms kind of try to hitch a ride before in the gearing <laughs> maybe that's why they pump gas into it I'm not sure I'm just I'm just guessing um, anyway <laughs> then the sounds stop altogether standard continues shut it off Faust shuts off the pump Roby says now what standard replies what do you think now we go in standard steps to the door and opens it a thick cloud of gas billows out interior food storage room the room is thick with poison gas and the men look like insects in their gas, gas masks the food packages are ripped to shreds and the foodstuffs are scattered all over the floor I'm just about to reach page 88. Faust says, looks like he helped himself. Carefully the men poke through the garbage, net and prods raised. Then Hunter points. God damn it. They all look where he's pointing. In the wall, a ventilator grill has been ripped open. Hunter continues. It escaped. They move to the shredded ventilator and shine their lights into it. Roby says, where does that go? Faust says, all over the ship. We'll have to check the charts to know for sure. Then let's go do it, says Standard. They head for the door. Have we got any food at all left in the ship? They slam the door shut and seal it. Interior bridge. The screens are showing them a schematic of the ship's system of ventilator shafts. Faust says that one section of the ventilator shaft has only two outlets. You notice the food storage room on one end. Page 89. Another stream marker. Page 89. Last two pages, nearly done. And the cooling unit on the other. So it's trapped in between. Now we have to drive it out. Faust says, poison gas. <laughs> this is, that's his reply for everything. Hunter then goes, We can't pump poison gas down into the cooling unit. It'll flood the whole ship. Standard says, The only other thing I can think of is for somebody to crawl in there and flush it out. Ruby replies, Are you crazy? Standard says, The man would need protection, obviously. As well as some way to drive the thing before him. Faust then says, how about a flamethrower? That wouldn't poison the air. Malcona says, so one of us goes into the air shaft and drives the thing along. Standard then replies, while the rest of us are weight down in the cooling unit with the net. Hunter says, sounds like a rough one. Standard replies, got a better idea? Hunter shrugs. So this is going to be page 19, this is the last page, and then I think I'm going to head over to Facebook to do a live stream there. And I will, um, I'll have footnotes ready for this uh, over the next two days. I'm a bit busy, I've got a studio party slash open studio on Friday, so um, I've got to prioritise that. Anyway, back to it, page 90. Roby says, so the only question left is who gets to crawl down the air shaft? 
Standard replies. Let's be democratic. He tears five small sheets of paper from a pad on his console. On one of them, he draws a large X. Then he wads each piece of paper into a tiny little ball. He rolls the paper balls between his hands and tosses them onto the table like dice. Martin, take one. Roby picks one up and unfolds it. It's blank. Morconis picks up another and opens it. Again blank. Faust picks up a ball and Standard immediately picks his own up. They are both blank. They all look at Hunter, who has not yet unfolded his. Standard continues. Open it up, Cleave. Interior, food storage room. Hunter is strapping on an oxygen mask and flamethrower. Faust is helping him. Finally, Faust hands him a tracking device. Well, uh, good luck. I hope you won't need me, but if you do, I'm here. Hunter replies grimly. Right. Hunter turns and climbs into the ventilator opening, which is just large enough to crawl through. And that's where we stop. So, yeah. Oh, I feel so good to be reading an alien script. Like, I've really missed this. I've, I've been so busy doing other things. And even though um, some of them were alien things, it's, it's just so nice to be able to go back and, and do the stuff that I had intended on doing in the first place. <laughs> so thank you so much for being really patient and i hope you've been enjoying this reading like i'm feeling really tired so i'm gonna have to stop the stream soon um but you know i, I hope you guys have been enjoying this like I've, I've been really enjoying reading through the script i know other podcasts may have done it before but i really wanted to go through and do it myself and, and really um do a deep dive into it and i really like how a lot of concepts have used in other films as well that you know, these ideas of Dan O'Bannon's and Ronchi sets weren't abandoned altogether and they've kind of like um, come to life in in later films or earlier films or prequels or, or sequels or whatever. Uh, so yeah, anyway, uh, thanks for joining me and I will see you guys, I think, tomorrow. It's a bit hectic. I'm going to try to do the stream in the morning, like pretty soon after I drop my son off at daycare and my daughter at school. Um, so yeah, hopefully I'll be able to see you then. Uh, thank you very much and good night. Bye. Hold on. <laughs> All right. See ya. Remember to like, share, or support Studio Yutani on Patreon, and subscribe to yutani.studio to stay up to date. Transmission complete. This is Mother 9000, signing off.